A reading from Luke's Gospel, the 8th chapter, verses 26 through 39. Listen for God's word. Then they arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As Jesus stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them back into the abyss. Now, there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these, so he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swineherd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the ones who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home. And declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Karl Barth once referred to the strange new world within the Bible. And I'm wondering if he had today's text in mind. I mean, let's face it, these, this is one of those texts that, uh, that seems so foreign, so far removed from our, our modern or maybe postmodern world. Wild men, demon possession, exorcism, and a flock of demon-possessed pigs which one commentator I read suggested was perhaps the first case ever of deviled ham. Could there really be anything in this text that speaks to us today? Well, we're going to find out. But to do so, we need to go back a few verses and set the stage for the events that we find here. In the eighth chapter of Luke's gospel, Jesus had been going around the region of Galilee. That's home for him, by the way. Remember, he grew up in Nazareth. He'd been going around teaching and, and healing, loving and forgiving, and people were starting to listen, they were starting to follow him. Luke tells us at the beginning of chapter 8 that Jesus was going through these cities and villages proclaiming and, and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were there with him as were some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. They included Mary called Magdalene from whom seven demons had gone out. There was Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward Chusa, and Susanna and many others, and, and they all provided for him out of their resources. Now after that, chapter 8 goes on with a few more familiar passages. There's the, the parable of the sower. You know that one. A sower goes out to sow, 
And some seeds land on good soil and some on bad. Then there's the lamp under the jar. No one would light a, a lamp and hide it under a jar. That wouldn't make any sense, now would it? And then, right before today's message, Jesus and the disciples get into a boat. And Jesus says, let us go across the water to the other side of the lake, and we know what happens next. Jesus falls asleep, and the heavens open up. A storm so bad that the disciples, many of whom were fishermen, become afraid that the boat is going to sink. So they go in their terror, and they wake up Jesus. How he sleeps through this is a miracle in and of itself. He promptly rebukes the wind and the waves. He calms everything down, and then he questions their lack of faith. And so the text tells us they were afraid and amazed and said to one another, Who is this that he commands even the winds and the water? And they obey him. And that leads to today's text. They were on their way there when the storm hits. So when the storm is over and the boat carrying Jesus and disciples finally lands, they find themselves on the other side of the lake in the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when Jesus lands, he is met there by a man possessed by a demon, actually by many demons, which is why he says his name is Legion. Luke also gives us a few interesting tidbits about the man. First, where this man had been living. The text tells us that he lived among the tombs. In other words, he lived in the local cemetery. We also find out that he was uncontrollable. The people there had tried tying him down. They had even used chains on him. But he would always break loose. And when Jesus shows up, the man rushes up to him, and Jesus promptly casts the demons out of him and sends them into a herd of pigs who kill themselves en masse by running down and drowning themselves in the sea. Now, perhaps not surprisingly, the people there, the Gerasenes, don't really know what to do about all of this. They were afraid when they saw this man sitting there act with Jesus, acting like a, like a normal human being for the first time in who knows how long. The text tells us that they were so frightened to see this man made whole again that they promptly asked Jesus to leave. So that's our text today. And as I read it and think about its context, one thing I'm curious about is which one of the miracles we have talked about is the most interesting. The calming of the storm, not in our text, but I talked about it. Then there's the exorcism, sending the demons into the herd of swine. <laughs> Pretty tough to decide, right? But when I think about it, perhaps the most amazing and interesting miracle of them all is the one that we may not even realize is there. It's where Jesus went to find this man who so desperately, desperately needed him. Now let me explain. First, Jesus leaves the comfortable, familiar, and predominantly Jewish area of Galilee and crosses the sea to the land of the Gerasenes. Now, this is Gentile territory, not a place a Jewish rabbi would normally venture. When Luke says the land of the Gerasenes is opposite Galilee, he doesn't just mean geographically. He means that the land of the Gerasenes is opposite of Galilee in every way. In other words, it's the neighborhood your mother warned you about. Don't go there. It's not safe. They're, um, 
they're not like us. And once on land, Jesus is, a, is encountered, many would say, accosted by a man possessed by an unclean spirit. Now that's an interesting designation. Reminding us that there are a variety of spirits, some life-giving and some not. And this one most definitely is not. And in Jewish custom, this man was not only perilous to himself and others, but he was also ritually unclean. To make matters worse, this young man no longer abides among the living in the local town, but rather dwells among the dead in the tombs. Tombs, we should note, are another place considered ritually unclean. All of which means that Jesus, the Jewish itinerant rabbi proclaiming the kingdom of God, goes to an unclean land to meet a man possessed by an unclean spirit who's living in an unclean place. In other words, this is the very last place Jesus should be. Which, when you think about it, is where God usually shows up. After this encounter, Jesus sails back home again, which may mean that the whole trek across a stormy sea and a turbulent run-in with townspeople distraught by their loss of livestock and frightened by the power of this rabbi was all done in order to meet this unclean man possessed by an unclean spirit living in an unclean and forsaken environment. All of which suggests to me the following. There is absolutely nowhere God is not willing to go to reach and free and sustain and, yes, heal those who are broken and despairing. Perhaps we need to remember sometimes that there is no place on earth that is God forsaken. Moreover, and perhaps more importantly, there is no person that is God forsaken or unclean or outcast or abandoned, unpopular, incarcerated, unbeliever, no one is left out. Consider, there is no indication that this Gentile man would later become Jewish or for that matter Christian. He wants to follow Jesus, but Jesus sends him back home with the instructions, go and tell what God has done for you. To put it another way, there are no conditions to be met to receive God's love. You don't have to be wealthy or poor. You don't have to be from one ethnic group or another. You don't have to have believed your whole life or come to faith only recently or have any faith at all. Jesus seeks out everyone, even this unclean man possessed by an unclean spirit living in an unclean place. Which might make us ask, where are we willing to go? Whom are we willing to love? Now, this is not often easy work, of course. It can be quite difficult. But at its heart, there is another and deeper truth here. Could it be that we are the man in today's text? 
Could it be that we are the one whom Christ has sought? Could it be that Christ does indeed come into the shadow lands of our lives? Perhaps it is true that Jesus shows up in the last place we expect him to be. Our place is a profound doubt of grief, of loss, of pain, and defeat. Even when, and this may be what surprises us the most, even when we have little interest in, let alone relationship with God. Could that be? Could we be the man? Friends, know this. God is with us. Sharing God's mercy and grace and giving us the hope we have in Jesus, the one who continues to seek us out when we are caught in the shadowlands, when we are eager for a new name, a new identity, a new future, when we are eager for the life that only he can give. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.